Our expedition around the world led us to discover and appreciate the extraordinary biodiversity of our planet. Of all the species encountered during our travels, there is one that particularly impressed us, an animal that looks like a siren, and that has been the source of many legends over time, a creature that continues to fascinate mankind. This creature is the manatee. The manatee is a marine mammal in the order Sirenia. Sirenia for sirens, which in some languages means mermaids. The mermaid legend likely first arose in the thoughts of lonely sailors, who imagined the body of a woman with the tail of a fish. This history also links the manatee with the siren song, a kind of luring marine lament, which some believe is the origin of the French name for the manatee, La Montagne. The manatee lives in coastal areas, environments that are becoming less and less wild, which is why coexisting with humans has become a problem. Coastlines are increasingly inhabited by humans, destroying essential habitat for this threatened species. The implications are troubling. Manatee populations are threatened with extinction around the world. Located south of Mexico and east of Guatemala, Belize is home to a population of manatees that use the country's bays and lagoons as essential habitat. Belize is a popular tourist destination. Each year, the country hosts tourists from around the world. And when you say tourists, you're inevitably saying boats, lots of boats. Since manatees are rather slow creatures living near the coast, it's almost inevitable that there will be collisions between manatees and motorized vessels. This is probably the main threat to the survival of populations of manatees at this time. But Belize has decided to participate in efforts to protect manatees. Each year, scientists gather in the tiny village of Gales Point near Southern Lagoon, which opens directly onto the Caribbean. The scientists work closely with local residents, whom they involved in their research. Some scientists travel great distances to study manatees here. Biologist James Buddy Powell is in charge of the research, and he has worked with veterinarian Bob Bundy for decades. It's gonna be a good day to go out and catch some manatees today. It's a lot of preparation, takes a lot of people, and uh, we're ready to do it. We have a lot of experience catching manatees, so a very experienced team. It's not very risky. The weather's perfect, and we're almost set to go. Uh, let's take the poles and move them up to the... Let's actually take the poles and move them to the other boat. Uh, this is Southern Lagoon, lots of manatees here. Uh, what we'll do is we'll take the boat. There's a small channel that winds up to this smaller lagoon, and it's called Quasi Trap, which is an excellent place to catch. It's usually very calm in there, shallow enough, hard bottom, and there's some holes there that manatees go into and a food that they prefer called halidouli. And so we're gonna start there. It's a good place to start. It's very safe. It's an easy catch if we find some there. It's a good place to start for us. Great, okay. Basically, we're on patrol. Um, all the eyes on the water help us to see the manatee. Uh, when the sun's out and it's nice and clear, uh, we can use our polarized glasses and we can see disturbances in the water. We're looking for mud plumes and things that might be associated with manatees foraging, feeding, or cavorting. And then when we see something, we'll, uh, we'll drive into that situation, assess it, and then set the nets. 
trouver un lamentin. To find a manatee in the turbid waters of the lagoon is a real challenge. You're forced to rely on ripples in the surface of the water to try to figure out where the animal might be. Or you look for some kind of mud cloud in the water, a mud cloud created by the movement of their tail fins. And if you're lucky, you'll see a small part of its head when it surfaces to breathe. So it takes a lot of experience, sharp vision, and I must say, a bit of luck. When the team spots a manatee, Buddy quickly begins to circle the animal with his specially designed boat. The net is quickly deployed, and everyone involved, biologists, veterinarians, and local residents, prepare to dive into the lagoon to secure the net. Everyone jumps in the water around the edge of the net um, to stabilize the net to make sure it doesn't drift. Um, and then once we get all the boat situated and the net situated, we put more people in the water with a small net that we just, just go in and sort of scoop them out uh, with that small net in principle to bring them into our capture net, which is where we do all the um, medical work. This is such a great spot, not only because it's a good place for manatees, but the bottom and the conditions are just perfect for these types of captures, which is what has allowed us to do such a long-term study like this. How many places can you go and find yourself next to an animal that weighs 1,000 pounds, kneel down and pat it on the back without getting trampled to death or bitten or speared or whatever? Um, I love manatees. I didn't learn anything that discouraged me not to. In fact, every day I get up, we learn something new. They're a marine mammal. They're very aquatically adapted. Uh, so they're quite different than most other mammals, so different that they're in their own order, the order of Sirenia. Now, they're more closely related to elephants. If you look at them, the, you know, the teats are underneath the front flippers here. The nails are similar. The skin is a little bit similar. And But rather than having a trunk like an elephant that they can use to pick up a peanut and bring it up to their mouth, manatees have this very prehensile muzzle. And it's used to grab vegetation, pull it up out of the bottom, and bring it into their body. Manatees have his hairs on the body, and we see the vibrissae on the front of their face, which are like a whisker on a dog or a cat. But these are also whiskers on the body, and they act like a lateral line. So this manatee doesn't need its eyes to see you in the water. They're using the sensory organ on their body that enables them to, uh, to basically visualize what's going on around them. They lost their hind limbs. Of course, they don't need them to propel through the water. They use these for steerage, their front flippers, and the tail is a spatula that helps them kind of push and propel themselves through the water effortlessly. From afar, the strange silhouette of a manatee may explain why sailors once associated this marine creature with the mermaids of their imaginations. Once the manatee is caught and brought on board the research vessel, biologists and veterinarians set about their tasks. And they are truly impressive. They have a very well-established work protocol. It's almost as if we were in a hospital and a dozen doctors gathered round to produce a complete health diagnosis. You just go right here, and you have to kind of feel it. And the gum, there we go. We just placed a temperature probe between her gum and her last molar, just so we can get a, a, a sense of her body temperature, her oral temperature. So if it rises too much, we'll know to keep her cool. Okay. Mm -hmm. So if she needs to breathe, just over yeah. the nostrils. Mm -hmm. Eleven sixteen. Austin or 1115.
We're measuring the subcutaneous fat layers, and uh, that will give us some information about our nutritional condition. It doesn't tell us the condition of the fat per se, but it gives us a, the thickness of the fat. Sticking. A sort of microchip is implanted under the skin of the animal to facilitate identification. With the aid of this chip, the scientists can then identify each animal by its unique number. So, if a manatee is recaptured, the medical team will be able to monitor their patient over a period of time. It really is medical care applied to animals. Belize certainly has been very proactive in terms of trying to establish protected for areas for manatees. By protecting manatees, you're also protecting habitat and very important productive habitat like estu you know, coastal estuaries and lagoons. So manatees are known as a, as a flagship species that helps us be able to protect these types of habitats that might be um, threatened. Before the animal is released, it must be weighed a delicate operation that requires special care, since the normally docile manatee can sometimes react violently. Buddy Powell has been fascinated by manatees since childhood. This Floridian encountered these strange marine creatures at an early age. They lived in the waters surrounding his hometown. The manatees of Florida are probably the best known of their species on the planet. They have become particularly well known as victims of collisions with boats. One day, someone was fascinated enough to make a film about the manatees. That person was Jacques Cousteau, and Buddy Powell's destiny changed completely after he met the captain of the Calypso. When I was 14 years old, the fellow named Daniel Hartman was working on his PhD from Cornell University, and he came to my hometown, um, Crystal River, which is now very famous for manatees. So he was out on the water, and it was obvious he was out of place, and so I was kind of curious because I was on the water all the time, and finally went up to him, and we started talking. And uh, we ended up becoming friends. He sort of took me on as his field assistant, and I worked with him for uh, a couple years while he was doing his PhD work. And then a number of years later, he had written an article for National Geographic, and the Cousteaus uh, saw this article and wanted to do the first documentary on manatees. And so he told them, get a hold of this kid in Crystal River, which they did. And uh, so I ended up being their guide for um, over a year uh, when they were doing this uh, first documentary. And that's really what began the momentum for all the conservation work and protected areas and measures that we have for manatees today. Manatees are very docile creatures, and they're docile because they're very intelligent. Um, and we use an adage, an elephant never forgets. Well, manatees have to remember. They have to have rote memorization that allows them to go back to a place and find it later. And the training starts when they're very young. The mother trains the baby, and then the baby picks up on that and, and emulates that. They don't produce a lot of babies, but one baby every two, three, four, five years. So they invest a lot in making sure that baby has all of the tools it needs to meet the challenges in the environment. If it doesn't if it fall short, the animal will die. So these animals, to be long-lived, have to invest a lot of effort into the, into the, the rearing of the young. Pull, man! Pull, 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 pull,
Okay, let's pull that net that way, bring him over slowly. This time it's not one, but two manatees in the research boat. The small vessel is getting a bit crowded, but the biologists and veterinarians have a well-established routine, and it is amazing how efficiently their work is accomplished, particularly impressive when one realizes that their research will serve the scientific community of the entire world. Manatees are great. Um, I think that I am passionate about because it's something unique to my country. <laughs> Okay, hey guys, we need to roller a little bit. With Buddy Powell and Bob Bundy and the whole team, it's, it's been wonderful. It's, it, we've built up this data set like no other for manatees, especially the Antillean subspecies. Um, we're getting information that we can apply for management decisions in this country, and we've been able to take advantage of what they have learned, and we can implement it, so that's a great advantage for us. We're going to take a, a tissue biopsy that we use for genetics um, to tell us uh, the, the, the fingerprint of this manatee, basically. And to get that sample, we just use some Novocaine. Um, we apply it with a needle into the skin here. This is the same medicine that uh, numbs the skin that the dentist would use to extract a tooth or to do dental work, and we use it on the manatee uh, so that it's less painful when we take the biopsy sample. We use it for uh, several things, stable isotopes to look at the food the manatee's been feeding on um, and what his chemical makeup is, and then we'll use it for uh, genetics in pedigree studies and fingerprinting studies of individuals. We've actually done quite a few studies that have been published on these Belizean manatees to tell us a little bit more about evolution of manatees in general. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's pretty special this morning. Two females, one of whom may be pregnant. And it's really amazing to see how well all the veterinarians and biologists have been trained. They can do a whole series of procedures in about 50 minutes. It's really a well-oiled machine. And it's extraordinary to see how quiet and calm the animals are. Are we ready? We do call this a cookie, um, and we do that because it, it resembles an Oreo. Yeah. Dark on the outside, white on the inside. It's not meant to eat, but it gives us the food for knowledge. And we learn through studying this little piece of tissue, it gives us some information about this manatee, which helps us to understand about manatees literally in general. And right now, how, how's the population status here? Yeah, well, actually, it's pretty good. You know, they don't have a lot of allelic diversity, so there isn't a lot of variation. A lot of the individuals are similar alike, but maybe they're similar alike for certain re reasons, that they've perfected this habitat, this environment, and that their best, uh, their DNA is best used and utilized to, uh, to achieve that. Au moment de la things got a bit out of hand during the weighing. Our two manatees became a bit edgy and knocked overboard everything that was nearby, including the huge structure that was used to weigh them, along with some biologists, veterinarians, and even members of the film crew. Really an impressive display of strength. With their caudal fins, they can break your bones in a flash. There are occasions when it's best just to abandon ship. What is surprising is to see how these remarkably calm animals can become so aggravated. They're able to lift their tails approximately one or one and a half meters. This is extraordinary, so it's best not to be too close at such moments.
The amenities weigh 1,000 pounds. Because it's so quiet and four or five people are around, everything looks okay. But as soon as it starts moving, it's not long before everyone's overboard. Yeah. Amanda, do we have a temperature? A lot of students come from abroad um, to gather data, to collect and, and do analysis in the U.S. in particular, but it's an opportunity for Belizean students as well. And what I'd like to see is more Belizeans getting involved, more Belizeans on the ground, collecting the data and using it for advanced degrees. But we haven't been able to capitalize quite as much on that as we'd like to. So that is something that I'd definitely like to push for the future. When we first started the study, or early on, Jamal would show up at our dock um, at the morning, sort of looking at us. He was about 11 years old, and he kept wanting to get on the boat, but he was too young. We found out later that um, Jamal, with some of his friends in the village there, that they, instead of playing cowboys and Indians, they'd play Buddy and Bob and take turns on who would get to drive the boat and who would catch the manatees. And so they would pretend that they were circling the manatees and um, uh, later on, you know, he was just so enthusiastic, we invited him to come on board as a volunteer. And then just one, one thing led to another. He was always part of our crew, and he continued um, uh, every year. And I think it, it enabled him to sort of see that there was more out there besides just what was in his village. And so he's continued on through his high school and now gotten his AA degree from the university. And he adores manatees and science and research and learning. This conservation field, I think, is something that I was born to do. And it's not necessarily a job to me, but it's a, it's my playing field. It's where I like being. It's my, it's where I'm in my glory, and it means more than anything to me. Cause this is where my passion is. This is where my heart is. As a scientist, it's extremely important to write scientific papers and publish. But what's really fulfilling but also extremely important is the people you leave there and leave behind and what you can contribute just like Daniel Hartman again did for me when I was 14 years old Jamal a child of the village grew up and today is living his dream acknowledged internationally for his work as a biologist and manatee researcher Just as Jacques Cousteau once did for a boy in Florida, Buddy Powell. Dreams come true, and careers are forged out of passion and determination. Despite conservation efforts in Belize, despite campaigns to try to reduce the speed of vessels, collisions are inevitable since these manatees are slow animals and they use the same areas as the boats. And collisions with boats may have truly catastrophic consequences for manatees. This young manatee lost its mother when she was hit by a boat. In poor health, the orphan was rescued by Jamal a young local biologist. Fortunately, today it is doing better, thanks to the care of a manatee rehabilitation center, Wild Tracks. Wild Tracks is a non-profit organization, and under that we have a number of programs, including the manatee rehabilitation program that cares for injured and orphaned manatee calves um, throughout the country are brought in here when they need care. So our role with that is to raise them up given the skills to be able to then survive once they're released back into the wild. When did you start Wild Tracks? The actual overall programs we started in 1990. Back in 1999, uh, we started the Manti Rehabilitation Program as one program under the organization as a whole. And how many manatees did you have since? So far, 10. Um, thankfully, not huge numbers, which would be a really bad indication of the status of the wild population, the pressures. But yeah, it's normally one or two manatees here in care at any one time. And how long are they staying in average? Um, about two to two and a half years. 
So here we're going to have the crew forming a line. We're going to move him through the gate and catch him on the other side here. So it takes enough people to have um, going up here, one to make sure he's not in a corner, move him through the gateway, and then we'll guide him into this corner for actually lifting him out. And this guy came in very emaciated um, in February of this year. His condition was critical, so we had to get food in. So he's been nasogastric tube fed, so a tube feeding tube up the nostril down into the stomach and uh, stayed on with that. Mm. So it's rather invasive, but it ha is what saved his life. You know, without that, there's just no way we would have kept him alive. The residents live in a natural basin within the lagoon that has been fenced off. Because they do not suffer the stress of an artificial environment, it is easier to reintroduce them into the wild. A little bit high, keep his tail off. Okay. Let's take him head in and then turn him round. Maybe if you do the water. Okay. So uh, we wait for that breath, insert the tube whilst the nostrils open. You see the valves closed. And then we uh, push the tube in slowly and carefully, trying to ease it to make sure it goes down the esophagus into the stomach. We have the tube measured against the back end of his flipper to make sure that we're reaching into his stomach about here. Um, when he came in that we were feeding him twice a day. Now we've cut it down to once a day, even once every second day, because we're trying to encourage him to eat more of the seagrass himself, because this is obviously a pretty invasive system, but when you've got a very emaciated animal, emaciated animal, you have to get food in as fast as you can and get the condition up. He's still probably 80 to 100 pounds underweight as compared to what he should be at this age. They'll lose weight really fast, but it takes quite a long time to put it on. And this is one way of getting the food into him. He's he came in at just under a year old, just pre-weaning, minimum weaning age, which is a very difficult age to get them onto a bottle. So he refused to take a bottle. His condition was so poor, we had to get nutrient into him immediately. The only option we had was to start him on nasogastric tube feeding. We can make up a very high energy, high protein milk mix such as this. And we know he's getting everything apart from the dribbles I'm spilling out here. I suppose that, you know, every uh, survival animal are very important because the population is pretty low around here. Indeed. Um, as an endangered subspecies, you know, it's critical to get as many back into the wild population as possible. Um, estimates vary for the Belize population anywhere from 500 to a maximum of 1,000 animals. Um, even if it's 1,000, that's not a very big population, and that's the biggest population of this species in its range. So getting each individual back into the breeding population is clearly a very important uh, task. So she would be happy to go back uh, in the water. Indeed, yeah. indeed. Yeah, it's always uh, straight down and take that breath of air and <sighs> done for today. OK, well, let's uh, move him in. Ready? 
and down. So he'll probably go down and come up about halfway along the pool for a fresh breath of air, I suspect. Another resident was waiting at the door of the enclosure. In fact, every day when the darkness sets in, Twiggy, a former resident of the center, returns to spend a night safely inside the enclosure. Uh, so now Twig is fitted with a radio transmitter that floats up. It makes it a lot easier finding out where she... In fact, there she is, just over there. You can see her just coming in. So we'll have one of the girls open up, let her in, then someone else can feed her down here. And this one is an, an old friend of you. Yep, she's been here for three years now. She's accustomed to us and vice versa. And actually, the last bit of rehabilitation is standing back, so they're learning to step back from people. In the first six months after release, it's also, OK, no one anywhere near, because obviously, as a wild animal, she's got to keep away from people rather than coming in the way she's still accustomed to coming in for feed. She's been on um, learning um, to live out loose for um, about 18 months now, so one of our assistants from the village um, started taking her out loose, supervised, taught her how to eat seagrass. He'd actually pick seagrass and eat it himself to show her. Um, gradually would step back, so instead of being with her, we'd leave her alone for an hour, two hours, until now she's let out about six o'clock in the morning. She'll go out all day grazing seagrass, and then about 4.30 in the afternoon she's coming back in to have a little banana shake and stay in her sleeping area for the night. So, yeah, it's, it's quite a good routine she's got, and we're just gradually extending, taking her further out, letting her explore further out, and she has a transmitter so we know where she is, until eventually she'll be going out through the creeks out to the bay itself. Buddy, Bob, and their team have left Gales Point for the busy waters of Belize City. Here, maritime traffic represents a real threat to the manatee population. Hunting is what has caused the population of manatees in Belize and generally the Americas to be at a threatened level. Sailors, pirates that would use the waters in Belize used to hunt the manatees and there is evidence um, around these keys as well uh, where Moho Key which is not too far off Belize City was a hunting site um, probably the Mayas also hunted them. Now the hunting has been replaced by them being killed by boats and so I feel like more than you, you can study an animal and watch its decline, but it, and at this point, the information that we gather and what we do is, is aimed at trying to reduce those threats. All right, guys, let me assign boats. Okay. One of you go on the capture boat, you decide, and then the other person can go on the fisheries boat. You're on the capture boat. Trenton, you're swimming. Um, you guys, stay where you are. Maureen, you're on the fisheries boat. about 20 to 25 percent of deaths that will be positively identified as being from a watercraft and we can identify that either from external injuries where the propeller will severely scar the animal where it would um, open up the animal or we would open the animal during a necropsy and when we open it it looks fine from the outside but when we open it we might find uh, a broken rib that has maybe punctured the lung and the only thing that would cause that would be a boat. If we were in Florida, this entire coastline would just be condominiums and houses and boats going this way and that way that the manatees would have to contend with. You would never see an animal without one boat strike. 
One of the reasons we're doing this study in this particular place is that there are boats going into the Belize River. So we we're trying to find out through our radio tracking, you know, how often they are moving over towards the river to be in harm's way. And so uh, with that information, then the government of Belize can act by putting up speed zones uh, where it's necessary, where there's the most chance of boat and manatee conflicts so they can make sure that at least in those areas, boats are going slowly enough so that not only do they not disturb manatees, but they don't hit them. There's no Sharpie. No Sharpie in there? This time, the team hopes to install a satellite transmitter on a manatee to better identify which areas the species uses and eventually to regulate maritime traffic. In the future, if they're not already, these animals are having problems with interactions with humans and boats and those kinds of things. We don't see evidence of a lot of scars like we do in Florida, but eventually we will. Once it's scarred, it's either scarred for life or it's dead. And when we see these scars, they came close to dying, but they survived and persisted. But they're going to carry that scar the rest of their life. Number three now. Okay. Tourism certainly is a wonderful thing for Belize. It's one of our biggest income earners for the country. Um, but we try to make sure that we are informing tour guides in particular where the hot spots where manatees are that they should be careful when they travel for instance the Belize River um, that is a very beautiful location in Belize it is used very heavily by tour boats and it's also used very heavily by manatees <laughs> together inserting the batteries uh, for the satellite transmitter. This is what we will uh, deploy in just a few minutes. It's all full of air so it floats like a buoy. It has two transmitters. One transmitter um, transmits up to um, several satellites and it has another transmitter that allows us to be able to follow it on the ground, on the water. How long will it last? Um, it'll last about a year. Um, the satellite part, it actually has a uh, salt switch um, so that when it submerges under the water, it shuts it off. And then when it comes up to the surface again, it starts transmitting again, and that helps us save batteries. Once a year. Protecting their habitat is the only real hope we have of saving the last survivors of this endangered species. Despite these conservation efforts in Belize, there are only between 500 and 1,000 manatees left, a very small number. Research must continue. The use of satellite transmitters will allow a better understanding of manatees' territories and come up with measures to protect habitats essential to their survival. One of the things we're trying to find out are where the most important areas are that they go. Um, and we do this so that when we're trying to establish protected areas, it's fine to protect one area here, but if the animal spends 50% of its time someplace else, you want to make sure that both areas are protected, So, and also the corridors in between. So this allows us to be able to find out what its critical habitat is and the corridors that they use to move in between. A number of them that we have tagged um, and with a collaborator in Mexico have come down from Mexico to Belize, to Southern Lagoon, for example, which we think might be an important nursery area. So this is the um, tether I was talking about. It, it won't knot. It's semi-flexible, and this, this prevents it from getting caught on and knotted up in mangrove. It's got a... Um, the belt has a weak link in it, and there's also a weak link inside here, so that if it does get caught on something, it will snap free.
we just want to, we're just making sure that the tag works. So when you, when you release the animal, um, you don't come out here and not be not able to find the tag because the frequency doesn't match the tag before we put it out. Because once it's out there, it's gone, man. Right? One, two, three. One, two, three. We can figure out the areas that they spend most of their times, and that will give us an idea to better um, manage the area that they hang out and protect them better. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Some people have asked that question, you know, why is it important to protect manatees? These animals are resilient, they're tough, and with protection and with a buy-in from the community and the people, we will have manatees around for future generations to enjoy. Buddy and Bob's team have captured over 20 manatees in under two weeks. This population is a model for research around the world, and this fantastic work will help us learn more about it. Manatees are excellent indicators of ocean health, especially in coastal regions. But they face the same threats everywhere. Habitat degradation, pollution, and obviously, collisions with boats. Fortunately, there are scientists who dedicate their lives to protecting threatened species like the manatee. And the next generation is taking up the torch. Young people like Jamal, or Buddy before him, are passionate about the environment and protecting biodiversity. With every dive, we are struck by the extraordinary biodiversity of the oceans. The goal of this mission is to document this biodiversity and appreciate its astonishing beauty but we are also seeing the fragility of the balance between species. Unfortunately, we are in the process of quickly destroying what nature has taken millions of years to perfect and adapt. The extraordinary diversity of life on Earth is expressed in a variety of shapes and colors. The result of slow evolution, plant and animal species interact in equilibrium to form the great tree of life present in our waters for probably more than 400 million years. Sharks are valuable predators that contribute to the vital balance of the oceans. However, nearly a third of the 64 species of sharks and rays in the world are now threatened with extinction, mainly due to overfishing. And they are not alone in this unenviable list of humanity's victims. Sea turtles have likely inhabited the oceans for over a hundred million years. Of the Earth's seven species of sea turtles, six are on the red list of species that are threatened or vulnerable. Among the oldest creatures of the sea, turtles have survived all of the natural disasters in Earth's history. But today, they are threatened by pollution, poaching, loss of critical habitat, and accidental entrapment in commercial fishing gear. In the space of just a few decades, humanity has managed to endanger the world's sea turtles, species that have withstood every other assault in the Earth's past. Fortunately, scientists all over the world are organizing to develop effective protection and conservation measures. We headed to Coco Island, famous for its pirate legends and the hidden treasure from Spanish ships that is said to be buried here. It's why we also call it Treasure Island. But for scientists, the real treasure is found in its exceptional biodiversity. Located off the coast of Costa Rica, in the Pacific Ocean, Cocos Island is a veritable paradise for divers and scientists. Known for its abundance of sharks and turtles, Cocos Island is home to a remarkable diversity of marine life. In these crystalline waters, 
The crew of the Sedna 4 were able to capture their first turtle, a real challenge for the divers. This green turtle will become part of a large research program to determine the migratory route of the species. The power of a green turtle's flippers is truly amazing. They are excellent swimmers, and their evolution has produced a huge muscle mass around the flipper joints. Obviously, this makes catching one a difficult operation. This feisty male is refusing to cooperate, but the scientists have met his kind before. This turtle will be equipped with acoustic and satellite transmitters, which will help us better understand the migratory routes used by the species. Once we got the turtle aboard the inflatable boat, we brought it to the Sedna 4, where a team of biologists was waiting. We have a special lift for large animals, so we lowered it into the Sedna's workshop, where biologists could attach the various transmitters. We invited two eminent turtle specialists on this trip to Cocoa Island. They often work in this region of the Pacific. These biologists became activists out of necessity because they firmly believe that taking real action in the field is the only way to change things. Oh, let me see, is there any 4062 there? No. Biologist Randall Arouse has devoted much of his life to the protection of sea turtles. He is accompanied by Todd Steiner, a biologist with the Sea Turtle Restoration Project, an organization dedicated to the conservation of sea turtles and their habitat. Todd and Randall organize yearly scientific expeditions to Cocos Island to monitor turtle and shark populations. Okay, we hold it okay, here. Okay, so take the measurements and then you do the tagging and I'll tag her. And you okay. can tag her and all. Yeah. Okay, so hold her there, Chipo. Okay. Okay, put this right there where the skin starts and the shell ends, or like right there, okay. 74 and a half. Yeah, 74 and a half, yeah, let's say 74 and a half. And width? Okay. What do you got? 72. 72. This is the first time we've caught this turtle. Hasn't been marked before. We're putting a tag on now, permanent tag. Yeah. Okay. Check the lock. Check. Perfect. PE312. Where, where are you going to do it? Same place. Wait. Right. Okay, it's locked. PE313. This is an acoustic tag, and these are the same tags we use for the sharks. And since we already have a system of, of listening stations around the island for the sharks, then we use the same system for the turtles. Okay. Okay. We've had turtles with the tag on for over a year, uh, sometimes a few months. Yeah. And you know, so you know, sometimes it seems like they're pretty permanently in there with you know cables and everything, but you they do fall off. Yeah. In the old days of sailors, couldn't keep fresh meat on board for very long, so they would stop at islands like this, grab turtles, put them on their back, and they could last for months. Come down once a week, just pour some water on it to keep it from drying out, and then they could use the meat as they needed. These turtles played a major role in uh, the exploration of, of the world. Okay. The green turtles of the Caribbean that people are more familiar with are purely vegetarians. They eat turtle grass, which is an algae. So they grow very slowly. This satellite transmitter will send a signal up to a satellite up in space, and then that will send the signal to my computer and I'll know right where this turtle is every day. We're trying to understand what the migration routes are. So when this turtle's here at Cocos Island, it's protected because there's a 12 nautical mile no fishing zone. But as soon as it swims out of that, we don't know. It could get caught on a fishing line and be killed. So our goal 
is to understand where these turtles go and then create marine protected swimways. So if they're swimming to Galapagos, we want to connect their swimways. We want to understand their migration routes and be able to protect them by closing fishing areas. So as you're doing that, yeah, we want to try to keep it kind of as, as hydrodynamic as, as we can. We've had turtles go as far as Panama. We've had turtles go to Costa Rica. We've had turtles go to Costa Rica and then swim up the shore all the way to El Salvador and then head back out to sea. And a lot of our turtles like it in Cocos and stay right around here. The juveniles, or the young ones, they definitely stay here for a number of years. For instance, we have turtles that we tagged here two and a half years ago and they're still there in Dirty Rock, for instance. So the young turtles live here, and the adults just swing by, and then they take off and continue their migration. There are different policies to protect turtles. For instance, special hooks, circle hooks, which they're less likely to swallow. But the best way to, is to protect the ecosystem, protect the habitat that they need to live. So if we can close those areas to fishing, then we'll have turtles for our kids to see and our grandkids. After a few hours, our guests can return to the sea. Randall and Todd check that the transmitters are working so this Pacific green turtle can regain its freedom. Now, now we have to be careful with the satellite transmitter. So let's do that. The transmitters on this green turtle will provide scientists with data on its movements. Okay. I'm basically, yes, in love with turtles. <laughs> this adult male has nothing to fear within Cocos Island National Park, but the protected area extends only about 12 nautical miles around the island. Beyond this border, turtles and other migratory animals of the island risk getting caught up in the baited lines of the long line boats. Thank you. Thanks to you. <laughs> I think we can say mission accomplished. The data gathered by the satellite transmitter will tell us more about the turtle's movements and may one day be used to establish protective corridors and areas where fishing is banned. But we must continue to raise awareness because there's still a lot of work to do before these essential conservation measures are put in place. Sedna heads for the Guanacaste region of Costa Rica. Known for its white sandy beaches, the area attracts tourists from all over the world. Beaches are an essential habitat for our planet's different species of sea turtle. They have served as egg-laying sites for millions of years, and they are vital for their survival. No beaches, no turtles. It's simple as that. But in recent years, beaches have undergone major changes, due mainly to a population boom of one species in particular, human beings. Not only do we use and transform beaches for recreation, but real estate development is constantly destroying this essential turtle habitat. Once female turtles reach sexual maturity, they return to the very same spot where they hatched to lay their eggs. This may be 15, 20, 30, even up to 40 years later in some species. After all those years, the turtles often return to find the beaches occupied by houses, lights that disorient them at night, or hotel patios. So the turtles often have a hard time laying their eggs safely. The problems of coexistence between sea turtles and humans are not new. You have to go back well before the arrival of tourists and the Costa Rican real estate boom to understand the origins of the problem at a time when the beaches were a meeting place for local villagers. They did not come to enjoy the white sand and the waves. In fact, they would come mostly at night when turtles came ashore to lay their eggs. Some Costa Ricans still remember 
that not so distant past when local traditions contributed greatly to the decline of the turtle population. What do the leatherback turtles mean to you? I feel there's something beautiful. They're so natural to me, a part of my life that I would never want to disappear. I remember that when I was young, my dad used to take us to the beach. He would say, let's go to the beach to collect eggs. It was normal to do that? Yes, but only to eat, never to sell. It was part of the culture? Yes. What was it like with the leatherbacks in those days? It was beautiful. There were so many of them, so many leatherbacks. It was incredible to see them on the beach at night. Biologists used to say that the leatherbacks would disappear, but we didn't believe them because there were just so many. Every season they'd say that we needed to protect them. And they were right, because we started seeing less and less. The economic hardships of those days played an important role in the illegal collection of turtle eggs. While the consumption of turtle eggs has long been a family tradition, it is their trade that continues to cause irreparable harm to turtle populations. Poachers can still fetch high prices for turtle eggs, and this threat is not a new phenomenon. One repentant poacher agrees to talk about it. Those were very hard years for everyone around here. There wasn't much work. And most people dedicated themselves to agriculture and animal farming. There was very little money to be made working the fields and fishing, so people had to find a way to make a little extra to help support their families. And an easy way to make money was by collecting turtle eggs. It was well paid. I also did it. You'd set up a stake and then walk 50 to 100 meters, maybe even more, and then put up another one, which meant that all the turtles within those boundaries were yours. In just one night, Around 200 to 300, maybe even 400 leatherback turtles would come. Nowadays, sometimes one or two, maximum five come. come to the beach, wait until the turtles laid their eggs, and collect them. On your way out, the egg buyer would be waiting on the street. In one night, you could collect 100 to 120 dozen eggs, and in some places more. If I remember correctly, they'd pay 400 colones, sometimes up to 600 per dozen. So as you can see, a hundred dozen at 400 colones was good money.
We just met two policemen, and of course, I took the time to ask them about the problem. They obviously were reluctant to talk in front of the camera, but what they told me was clearly that there are poachers, especially in the area on the other side of the bay, and people are selling their eggs throughout Ostional. Ostional is a place about two hours from here where there are huge beachings of turtles, and there is a big laundering of turtle eggs in Ostional. They say all the eggs come from Ostional, so it's okay to sell them. I'm told that there are bars where for one dollar you can have a cold beer with a beautiful turtle egg with Tabasco sauce. They drink it and it's ecstasy. So the community still has a special relationship with these eggs. Rodney Piedra Chacon is director of Las Bolas National Park. Rodney and his team will spend the night on a small, isolated beach. Another long night spent protecting turtles from poachers, seeking to steal the precious eggs. Tonight, I'm going to take you to one of the most important beaches for green sea turtles, at least in our country. It's called Nombre de Jesus. It's a very beautiful, undeveloped beach by a forested area. It's a great nesting ground for this species. To protect endangered species like this one, it requires commitment from everyone. We all understand that there are many interests at stake, scientific, community, development, and fishing interests. Nonetheless, it's very important that we find a common goal so we can support each other in this struggle for conservation. Reducing poaching to protect the eggs is an essential factor for conservation. Is the only way to access the beach? By vehicle, yes. This is the only route. There's a way to get there by foot, but you have to go over a mountain, so it's difficult to access. This is tricky. Maybe through the middle. One wheel there, one over here. Listo. Made it. In our country, there are protected and unprotected areas. At present, this is a very important nesting ground. So to ensure the conservation of this species, we're putting a lot of effort into creating a management strategy for this area. We organize ourselves every night on the beach. One of the first things we do is walk the whole length of the beach together. This way, we can get an overall idea of what is happening on the beach, of whether there are people and turtles or not. The idea is to have some time to calmly analyze the situation. When we find tracks, we stop and follow the trail to see what the turtle is doing, and immediately we all get to work. Those lights over there, what are they? The main reason we all come together is so the egg poachers see a big group of conservation workers and know that we're here to back each other. Three, 
esas luces en el fondo que, que se We think they may be egg poachers. So we'll have to be more careful from now on. Con más cautela. We decided to use the night, too, to witness the spectacular sight of green turtles laying their eggs. But in certain areas of Costa Rica, it's not a good idea to walk the beaches alone, because poachers are still very active. So we decided to accompany a team of biologists from Las Bolas National Park in their work to protect egg-laying sites. In recent years, Turtle egg poachers have started working with drug traffickers in certain areas of Costa Rica. Poachers can earn up to $300 a night by selling eggs on the black market. The eggs are worth about $1 each on the street. In 2012, a heavily armed group of poachers got into a turtle egg nursery, a place where turtle eggs that have been collected by volunteers are placed until they reach maturity. The volunteers were tied up, and the poachers made off with over 1,500 eggs. The message is clear. Poachers do not want turtle conservationists on their beaches. We'll start by measuring the length and then width of the shell. You can check on the other side to see if the turtle has a metal mark or tag. If it does, read out the identification number so she can log it. Okay. Okay. L-O-S-T-S. Okay. 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 I'm going to dig a bit so we can see better. It's a little complicated right now because there are many roots. Do you want help? No, no, that's all right. Today we're going to move the eggs to a different location here on the beach. So you'll be able to see how we move them. If this were a protected area, the nests would remain untouched because there would be 24-hour surveillance. Normalmente, si es un área protegida, entonces los niños quedan in situ. Entonces tenemos protección. But at this time, we can't protect the beach 24 hours a day. So we have to move the eggs to a safer location. How many are there? There are 56 at the moment. How long does it take? She can last 10 to 15 minutes. She's still laying eggs. Is the turtle in a kind of trance as she lays her eggs? Yes, actually. All turtles go into a trance-like state in order to be able to shift their muscles to lay their eggs. <laughs> That's why. When she's done, we have to leave because she starts moving. It's very moving. 
Oh, yes. It's amazing that she does all this work. A half hour of preparation, and she closes it up all with great care, and the eggs are not even there. She does not even know that eggs are not there. What we're going to do now is bury the eggs in another location on the beach. The others at this time are digging the cavity where we'll put the eggs, a spot we consider much safer. How deep will it be? The idea is that the depth of the nest has to be similar to the depth the turtle gave it, so between 45 and 50 centimeters. Once we've reached the right depth, we'll carefully place the eggs into the cavity. What's great is that, for generations, these young people would normally have learned to become poachers. But this is a new generation, and their mentality has changed. It's the young people who are taking things in hand and trying to save the turtles. It's great. After, we'll place an aluminum tag that will allow us to identify the nest in the next 45 days, when the hatchlings emerge. Now, we'll bury the nest. And Luis will pack down the sand as best as he can to protect the eggs. After that, we will mark the nest in relation to that stake over there. If the poacher find the, the little uh, stick... What we do now is bury the tag in the sand so that when we find it, we can see from which nest the hatchlings emerged and which turtle laid those eggs. That's how we can determine what this turtle's hatching success was in regards to this nest and all the nests. Of these 82 eggs, how many will make it into the water? The hatching success last season was between 80 and 90%. It's great to see young people involved in protecting turtles. Their work on the beaches will save many turtles, but will, above all, help change people's mentality. This is essential if we want the new generation to change their ways and condemn poaching. I think the new generation is ready to do everything it can to protect these threatened species. There aren't many egg poachers left. And then, what has changed? People's mentality. And the fact that Tamarindo has developed into a tourist destination, creating more job opportunities. What's your job now? I'm a tour guide. After poaching, many of us became tourist promoters, and we learned a bit about the biology of the turtle. There are far fewer poachers on the beaches around Guanacaste now, 
especially since Las Bolas National Park was created. Today, tourists come from all over the world to witness turtles laying their eggs. But poaching is still a serious issue in some areas of Costa Rica, and illegal egg trafficking still threatens the survival of turtle species. If we want to save them from extinction, we must continue to educate people. Our objective is to maintain the turtle population that nests in the area. And to do that, we need to make sure those legs are laid and hatched here. We believe that our efforts are essential if we want to preserve such an important and beautiful species. How do you see the future? I believe that we're very committed and we're convinced that we can recover these populations. It's been a very long process trying to educate people. It has required strong commitment. But by the number of people now getting involved, I think Costa Rica is becoming more environmentally conscious and committed. Not just the organizations, but the communities themselves are becoming involved in protecting their resources. They are becoming empowered by making this struggle their own. I think the fact that we're out every night, six or seven hours, trying to save these nests is so very important. I know we might not see the results of our efforts in the short term, maybe not even in our lifetime, but most likely our children will see the results in 20 or 30 years. And they'll know that all the efforts of conservation made by those who started this were worth it, and that they must continue. The magnificent Playa Grande Beach in the Guanacaste area is a favorite destination for day tourists. But at the end of the day, the tourists must leave because the beach is now a protected area. After nightfall, no one is allowed on the beach, with the exception of a few biologists and volunteer patrollers. At night, this beach belongs to one of the oldest and most remarkable creatures of the sea, the leatherback turtle. At high tide, this female leatherback turtle comes ashore to lay her eggs, just as others have done before her for millions of years. For over 20 years, the organization The Leatherback Trust has protected the turtles of Playa Grande. Biologist James Patilla and Frank Palladino have been part of the organization since its beginning. In all those years, they have fought many battles. It's an animal which has a flexible shell because it's not hard bone. It's got little bones with cartilage in between. It's got a leathery shell, that's, that's where it gets its name, a, a skin like a dolphin on the shell and on the flippers. It has a pink spot on the middle of its head, which is where the pineal gland is. It has some signaling for hormones. The skull's only half as thick there. They can dive a mile deep like a whale, so the shell collapses when they do that, gets compressed, and they only eat jellyfish. So they must be our friend, we don't like jellyfish. centimeters long, probably around 18 to 20 years of age, and she's finished nesting. She's now in the process of early burying, but you can see how delicately she's yeah. using her hands to pat the sand down and to pack it so that the eggs are in a nice location, and then she will start to camouflage and cover all around here. So when we came here, the number of turtles nesting per year was 1,500. And then it declined exponentially, so by big steps. To the present time, there's about 
maybe 50 nesting a year. But it's bottomed out the last three or four years, so we think that we've, we're about for, due for a comeback. The new turtles that we see now are as a result of these students and volunteers who are on this beach for 20 years. And so, yeah, those, those are our turtles who are coming back. You have an opportunity to see a dinosaur come out of the ocean and do all these very intricate behaviors. And I don't think there's anybody who ever walks away from this beach after seeing this experience that hasn't been awed. The first time we came on the beaches here, uh, Frank Palladino had to pay the local poacher for permission to work on a turtle after he took the eggs. Then he was okay if we studied the physiology of the turtle. After the park was founded and we got more involved and Frank taught the people English and we taught them some biology, now those poachers all became guides, ecotourism guides. So they make more money, cleaner. Now at this point, their children are the guides. Right now, this is a national park. There's national park guards. We have very good protection. There's an occasional poacher, which is usually a stranger who's come into town. And a lot of times, there are uh, uh, Nicaraguans that come down here to work on construction of homes and so on. And they want to make some quick money so they can catch a bus and go back home and visit their family. But for the most part, the local people are no longer the poachers. As a matter of fact, whereas before they were against the park, it is the local people who are the strongest supporters of the park. When we first came here, the people used to be poachers. They hated us. They didn't like us in the local village. Now we're friends. Um, our students are friends with, with the young people. And I think it made a big difference. So the, the people see that these turtles are a benefit to them. I think it's very important. This work of Frank Palladino, James Spotilla, and countless volunteers is truly inspiring and proves that mentalities can be changed. But in certain areas of Costa Rica, much work remains to be done. For example, in 2013, a 26-year-old biology student named Jairo Mora Sandoval was kidnapped from a beach in Costa Rica along with four other patrollers. Drug traffickers and poachers were fed up with turtle protection campaigns and wanted their beaches back. That night, the young biologist was tied up, beaten, and shot in the head. Jairo Mora Sandoval died simply for wanting to protect a threatened species. This tragic story made headlines around the world, and environmental groups responded by offering a reward to find those responsible. The government of Costa Rica has promised an inquiry. The protection of turtles and beaches is often spearheaded by the work of passionate people and volunteers who come from around the world to get involved. Unfortunately, the weapons of poachers everywhere are often intimidation and violence. We must continue to highlight and support protection efforts and encourage volunteers to patrol the beaches in order to change people's mentality. This is probably the only true hope for the future. The changement of mentality constitue probably the only true hope for the future.